when I see people that come to lectures like this, whether it's here or in, in other countries, all over the world, I travel a lot. The first thing I think is we have so much in common. We have a lot more in common than differences. We all want the same thing. We all like the same things. We all work for the same things. We all want to see good happening. We all want to give a good future for our children, to live well with our neighbors, to be happy with each other, to have world peace. Who doesn't want that? So what unites us is much more than the difference, the cultural difference, because what happens is that we want the same thing and we want to live together in peace. It's important to acknowledge the good that we have and the very fact that we want good and that we hope for good. You know, whatever we would like to have, we hope for. And that hoping for good is a kind of prayer. A lot of people don't believe in prayer. They don't think they should pray. They, there's nothing to pray for, whatever. The fact is that when we have hope for something good, we do believe in something good. I know somebody who said to me very frequently, I don't believe in anything. That's a common thing today. And I kept saying to him, you believe in good, you believe in honesty, you believe in harmony, you believe in happiness. You do believe in something. Don't give it a name, but don't say you don't believe in anything because when you believe, you hope for those things. When you hope, you are praying. It doesn't matter what, what it is. Otherwise, you wouldn't even think of good if you didn't try to have something better for the world. To me, that power, which is good, is God. I call it God. I think I know what it is. I'd like to talk about it with you. A lot of people don't call it God. It doesn't matter. There is only one power that governs the whole universe. Doesn't matter what culture we belong to, there is only one power that governs the universe. Prayer is to acknowledge that power. We learn in Christian science, and this is a Christian science lecture, we learn in Christian science that prayer is not only asking God for something that we don't have or asking God to change something, but it is recognizing, acknowledging what God has already done. When we begin to recognize that God does something good, we are praying. And the Apostle Paul in the Bible does recommend that we pray without ceasing. This is something I like to say all the time. We can pray without ceasing. We can turn to that infinite power that governs the whole universe all the time. We don't need to stop what we're doing. We can turn to that infinite being and know it's there. It is power. The whole vast universe, which is infinite, is not empty. It is filled with the intelligence that governs it. That intelligence is God. And acknowledging that intelligence is a way of praying. We can do it all the time. It helps us. It helps anybody. I learned this by studying Christian science and studying what Mary Baker Eddy, the woman who discovered and established Christian science as a church and as a religion, I, that's how I learned it, and reading her book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. So we are able to acknowledge and to learn 
and to pray without ceasing according to re the recommendation of the Apostle Paul. Mary Baker Eddy was a deep Christian and a follower of Jesus' teachings, Jesus Christ's teachings. And by following his teachings, she also was a very deep student of the Bible. The Bible was the only authority for her. And she read the Bible in a way that it made sense. She always found the love of God in the Bible. She was raised in, a, in the 18th, 19th century at the time when condemnation and punishment were the way to learn about God. She couldn't accept it. She, it didn't make sense to her. And her understanding of God as love, as she found it in the Bible, gave her a certainty that we can trust that love. Going back to the Apostle Paul, he says in Second Thess First Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. It's funny that before those words, he says, rejoice evermore. In other words, before you pray, rejoice. And that's a nice way of starting our praying by acknowledging that God is good. Rejoice, being happy about God, and then pray without ceasing. Not asking God without ceasing, but acknowledging that God is present. That there is a power for good that is present. Some time ago, I was in Switzerland lecturing, and I was talking about the Apostle Paul's recommendation. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. And I was telling just what I told you. By acknowledging that God is present, we are praying. And that prayer helps. I went over those ideas for a while, and then I noticed that right in front of me, there was a nun. She was sitting right in the middle in front of me. She was a guest of a friend of mine. I was very happy to see her, and the first thought I had was of tenderness, of compassion. Somehow my heart went out to her, and I felt very honored with her presence. So as I was lecturing, I thought all the time, when the lecture is over, I'm going to talk with her, thank her for being here, and, and say how honored I am that she came. And I did just that. At the end of the lecture, I went to her, and I told her I felt honored and grateful. She grabbed both my hands, and she had tears in her eyes. And she says, you don't know how much you helped me. She went on to tell me she was there. She was from Canada, and she was on a mission of working with the children of the refugee camps in Europe. And this was about two or three years ago when those refugee camps were filled with people who left the Middle East and didn't know where to go. They were not welcome where they were. They couldn't move forward. They couldn't go backward. They had no hope, no home. They had no idea what to do. And she was dealing with a refuge, the children of those refugees. She said, the, the things she was facing every day was so, so much suffering, so heartrending, so difficult to deal with, and she, there were so few people to help. She felt overwhelmed, exhausted, and, and she was feeling very guilty because she didn't have time to pray. And when I quoted the words of the Apostle Paul, pray without ceasing, rejoice evermore. She realized she could do that. So she took from that lecture that message that she could, she didn't have to feel guilty. She could pray all the time in the middle of the difficult tasks that she had to do during the whole day. This conversation with her was very quick, but I had to tell her with the same feeling you don't know how much you have helped me. 
because so far, this is the first time I am in touch with somebody who is directly involved with that. I had never been in touch with anybody involved with it. And I can see what you're dealing with. Until this moment, all that to me was news. I got it in the newspaper, I got it in the radio, I got it in a computer, television, but I had never met anybody working with it. And that made all the difference in the world. And I realized that I too have the obligation to pray. We cannot just be indifferent because it's happening out there, whether whatever out there may mean. And at that moment, out there was not in our own backyard as it is now. Because I wrote this three years ago. So all of a sudden, and I told her, you are helping me to deal with this problem as something that I have to do with. Just because it's not happening with my family doesn't mean I have nothing to do with it. We all are in a position to pray and to know about God. So the help we gave each other was mutual, and I'm very grateful for that experience. So I decided to write something and share with my audiences the ideas with which I pray about those situations so that everybody can be involved. Nobody can look at them and say, I don't have anything to do with it. So let's see what are the situations that we need, we need to deal with. One of them, which um, very often people think, is where is God when we see so much suffering? What is God doing about it? Did God select a group of people to suffer? Is God angry with his creation? So people do wonder about that. And what we need to do is understand what God is. When we understand what God is, we are equipped to pray and to help anyone in any circumstance. When we learn what God is, there are two important things. We have to learn what man is. And we have to learn what isn't God. We have to get a higher, a spiritual, a wider, and a, an infinite concept of God. When we begin to understand that, it helps us to improve the human conditions. We can't go there. Most of us don't have any access to anything that will solve the problem. But our understanding what God is and what man is, when we go higher in our understanding of that, that helps those situations. So it's not in vain, and we can. We have the obligation of doing that. The first thing I would like to convey is the idea of the infinitude of God's presence. The principle that governs the universe, there is a principle that governs the universe, is not localized. It's not cultural. It's not resident in a place. It, much less, it's not confined in an image, in a statute, in a painting. It is a principle. It's a law that governs the whole universe. That infinite intelligence that governs the universe, God, and his image and likeness, the idea of God is man. Somebody said to me once, how can man be an idea? Well, this infinite intelligence that governs the universe is mind. It's one infinite mind. And what does a mind have? ideas. So we are, each one of us, an idea in that mind. We here and everywhere, every man is an idea of God. And I'm not talking about the physical man, I'm talking about what the Bible refers to as God's image and likeness. 
God is seen through his idea, and his idea is man. That's a very generic statement. But again, when we go to a higher concept of God and man, we can help the suffering of mankind, to alleviate the suffering of mankind. This one infinite God, this one infinite mind that fills all space, is not at conflict with itself. It's not divided. It doesn't have privileged ideas. It is infinite, it is harmonious, and it is at peace with his own creation. That infinite mind never had separate segments of ideas or separate segments of society. Mary Baker Eddy, who I said before, was the discoverer and founder of Christian science, wrote several books. The most important one is Science and Health with Key to the Scripture. But she wrote other books, and there's a compilation of her books, which were written at different times, called Miscellaneous Writings. In those Miscellaneous Writings, there's a passage where she talks about God this way. God is universal, confined to no spot, defined by no dogma, appropriated by no sect. That's a pretty wide definition of God. The divine intelligence that governs the universe is aware of his own presence and infinity. We can start our day by knowing that. God is aware of his own presence, and we are aware of God's presence. Praying that way is something we can do in the middle of what we're doing. It doesn't interrupt our activities. It helps us to do what we have to do. And of course, when we are dealing with these such migrations and the, this great number of people looking for a place where to live or a home, not a house, but a sense of home, look at history and you'll find that the quest for home isn't new. Migrations have existed throughout the history of mankind. And even in Bible times, several thousand years ago, there were writers who were talking about migrations and a notion of what home is. In the book of Psalms, we read, Lord, thou hast been our refuge from generation to generation. Even then, the man who wrote that verse of the Psalms knew that we can take refuge mentally and spirit, spiritually in God's presence. That's a refuge. And that's something we can all find. Man is, a God is our refuge for all generations not for this area, for that area, or for this culture, throughout all generations. He knew that there is an infinite intelligence that governs the universe, and that infinite intelligence never lost sight of any of his ideas. Man is not a point in space, lost, not knowing where to go. Man is not a foreigner in God's universe. No one ever left God's presence. You may be asking, and many people are asking, what about these situations of these migrants going from one area of the world to another? And this is kind of an epidemic going on now. We, we see this in our own country here. I see it in Brazil, people leaving Venezuela and crossing the border, arriving in areas where they say there is no infrastructure to receive them. 
We read about it in the Middle East. We read about it from Africa. Some of these situations, people leave and they die in the way because nobody knows what to do with them. So th this is, is kind of happening all over the world. It's not one particular place or one particular problem. And in all these cases, there's controversy about it. Those of it who are not there, but who are ruling and making decisions of what to do or not to do about them, there is controversy. There are sides to the story. It became polemic. And if you analyze those sides, you can find that sometimes it looks like both sides are right or both sides are wrong. It's not something that one can say, this is the right side, and, and that wouldn't help. So in the, kind, in the situation of such a very strong controversy and very uh, divisive polemic situation, how do we pray? What do we pray for? I learned in Christian Science that the real prayer is not for this or for that, for one side or for the other side. Again, we don't ask God to do this or that. Real prayer is looking up, away from the sides, away from the controversy, into the reality of God's presence. That's a spiritual, infinite perspective that we can look out from. When we are able to take God's side, which is not a side, we can look at the whole situation from a higher perspective and just acknowledge and find our own peace and comfort and knowing, yes, there is a God, and that God is love, and there is a solution this is not optimism, it's reasoning about God's presence, reasoning about God's love. When we do that, we help those individuals that we don't even know about. And this brings me to another subject that is also sometimes controversial. Did Jesus have a home? Well, let's see what I found in the Bible about it. Most of you have, know a little bit of the Bible. You know the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, there is a description of when Jesus was approaching a group of people. Among them was John the Baptist, who at the time was not a disciple of Jesus. And John the Baptist had his own students. Two of John the Baptist's students saw Jesus coming by and went after him. They walked right behind him. And when Jesus realized that they were there, he turned around and said, what do you want? So these two young men looked at him and said, Master, where do you live? Do you know what he answered? Come and see. And he invited them to spend the day with him. So these two young men spent the day in Jesus' home. They were guests of Jesus. To me, that proves that Jesus did have a home. It's not true that he didn't have a home. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't talk about his home all the time, but that doesn't prove he didn't have one. Very often his ideas were rejected and were not accepted, and that perhaps gives room for people to say he didn't have a place to lay his head. His ideas were not accepted promptly, but he did have a place where to live. And those two young men were guests at his house. Jesus very often said that God was his father. 
he always referred to God as his father. And he also referred to God as our father. So we have the same father. He never said himself that he was God. He said God was his father. And in his many sayings in which he starts by referring to God as his father, is one that says, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. He himself was aware of the need for home for many people. And with love, he tells people that there are plenty of spaces in God's universe. And that understanding God brings people to their home. And home is not a house. We're not talking about a building or a, we're not talking about Jesus going out in the real estate market trying to find home for people. But it does mean that that idea of God's love that Jesus was teaching is available throughout history to make people find harmony. I think that's important. All prayer and all understanding of God leads to harmony. That's what people want. It's not wanting more of this, more of that, but finding harmony, finding peace. Jesus was the highest manifestation of God's love for mankind. Jesus was sent by God to mankind. When Jesus appeared in the human scene about 2,000 years ago, there was controversy in the country about government. And his appearance was supposed to bring harmony and peace. In that area, most people spoke either Hebrew or Greek. And the word Christ in Greek means exactly the same thing as the word Messiah in Hebrew. And that means the anointed, the one God anointed to bless mankind, to teach mankind about God, to reveal God's love for mankind. So whether people call him Christ or Messiah, it means the anointed. His name was Jesus. Now, Jesus is no longer here. We know in history what happened. He was crucified and he ascended. So the man Jesus is not here with us. But what he gave mankind, the spiritual teaching, the intuition, the understanding that comes to mankind through his words, through his teachings, didn't disappear. That is the voice of good that speaks to human consciousness. That's really what we call the Christ. Not Christ the man, because Christ is not a man, Jesus was a man, but Christ as that anointing message from God to man that did not disappear. It is speaking to our consciousness all the time. And Mary Begrady talks about it as the voice of good speaking to human consciousness. Sometimes we feel it isn't because we're not listening. But it does speak. And it's up to us to listen and to respond to it. It shows the way to harmony. It shows the way to peace. It brings quietness to mankind. This is not getting this or getting that or getting more or dominating somebody. It's just feeling that peace that comes from trusting that in the infinitude of God's presence, nobody's left out. God's universe is infinite. It is not empty. 
and it is not overcrowded because it is not physical. It's the idea of God's infinitude. We can turn to that idea and know that no idea of God, meaning man, is displaced or out of place. Mrs. Eddy talks, uh, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven. And Mrs. Eddy refers to heaven as harmony. Heaven is not up there, it's not a location. It is harmony expressed. So how often do you hear people saying, oh, this is heaven, which means this is wonderful. This is harmonious. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God. And we find it when we find harmony, not when we go somewhere. Mrs. Eddy says in, in her book, Science and Health, talking about the way to harmony, she says, there is but one way to heaven, harmony. And Christ in divine science shows us this way. She's not saying it's Jesus, it's Christ the voice of good today shows us this way. It is to know no other reality, to have no other consciousness of life than good, God and his reflection, and to rise superior to the so-called pain and pleasures of the senses. So there is a way to heaven. It is to know God's reality. It started by saying, acknowledge God's presence. We can acknowledge God's reality. That's the way to heaven. That's the way to heaven. It's available for everybody. It means to look up, away from conventional thinking, Higher, it means to think in a different direction. It means to think of a different reality. And when we begin to think that there is a spiritual reality, a divine reality right where we are, that is an awakening. And an awakening is a pilgrimage. It's not a pilgrimage towards a place, but it's towards a higher understanding of God and of man in God's presence. In that presence, we can never lose our place. We can never lose our home. Going back to the Apostle Paul, he said, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, eternal in the heavens, not made with hands. That home, not made with hands, is a concept of being in God's presence. It's not for the future. It's not for the beyond. It's for now. And we can turn to that and find it. <clears throat> It's the highest concept of home. It is not a material structure. And our way to that home is our pilgrimage to a higher concept of our spiritual home. And the more we attain that, the more we will prove it in our own experience and in our own finding home. That's our spiritual journey now of each one of us. And the more we know it, the more we can help others. The consciousness of a material house shifts into a consciousness of home in the presence of the principle that governs the universe. Nobody can lose that home. I'll tell you an example. Do you want to hear one? I'll tell you an example when my husband and I were able to find home in a difficult circumstance. My husband and I came to this country 
to work for the church who invited us to work. So we don't qualify exactly as immigrants because we were offered a job and we came to work here many years ago. So we were newlyweds. We were living in an apartment which was not satisfactory. We were not at all happy with where we were living, but that's what we could afford. We were very young and very new in, in, in the city where we were living. But anyway, we were looking for a better place to live. And what we were really looking for was a home that enabled us to do our work better. We were looking for a place that would serve our purpose. And our purpose was to work for the church, to work for mankind. We wanted to live in a place that gave us that opportunity and the comfort to do that work. A home that served us. Not a home that we would have to serve like slaves to maintain the other way around, a home that served our purpose. Well, financially, everything we saw was beyond our means. Everything that seemed to be appropriate was beyond our financial means. A couple of friends of ours invited us to see their apartment. It was a new high-rise building in Boston, and although it was new and supposed to be a very expensive luxury uh, building, it was soon put under rent control by the city of Boston. So the apartments were magnificent, but the rents became affordable. Consequently, everybody wanted to go live there. So the, these friends had us over, we saw the, their apartment, we thought that was exactly what we needed. And the, he introduced us to the manager. And the manager said, yes, uh, yes, uh, we have plenty of those, but because it went under rent control, the waiting list is of two years, and I'll be happy to put your hand, your, your name there which was fine, but we couldn't wait two years. We needed a solution to, for our predicament immediately. However, we had a great sense of peace that we had found what we wanted. We had looked all over, and this was exactly what we needed. So we went back home to our little apartment, very happy that we had found it. We didn't go frustrated because it wasn't available immediately. We went happy because we had found it. And we stopped looking. We were so grateful that it existed and that it was available and that we were not going to be left in a predicament or that all the good that we were looking for was not for the future, was not for tomorrow or for two years. It was available. We were very peaceful with that thought that the good that God had shown us was not for the future. Two weeks later, the manager called us and said that there was an apartment available. If we wanted, we could move immediately. We moved in immediately. And we lived there for five years until we were able to buy our own home. So this was a wonderful proof that the good God has for each one of us right here in this modern world is available now. It's a matter of shifting the way we look at it and instead of asking God for something, acknowledging that the goodness of God is present and is available for everyone. And it is available for everyone that apparently is in a refugee camp or is fleeing injustice, oppression, or whatever the reason is for um, migrations. There have been migrations all over history for a great number of reasons. 
Usually, it's because of injustice, famine, oppression, persecution. Oppression dissolves when God is understood. Not when God is imposed, but when God is understood. The understanding that God is love dissolves oppression. There have been, as I said, a great number of reasons why people migrated. However, there was one very special migration in history which took place in the 1600s. And it was a migration that brought people from England to America. And that was the origin of this country. The reason why people moved from England to this country at that moment was because they wanted to live in a country where they could have freedom of, for worshiping God the way they wanted without religious or political persecution. They were called the pilgrims. And the pilgrims came from England to the States to establish themselves. They didn't come in order to get silver or gold and then go back richer. They came to settle. They came with their families to settle in a country where they were free, free to worship the way they wanted. This is the origin of the United States, the first country that gave to its citizens freedom of speech, of religion, and of press. At that time, that was new in the world. And it existed. And in a short time, the United States became a free country based on those freedoms. And it was because those people dared to flee, to migrate, looking for a place to worship God with freedom, without oppression, without persecution. This happened in the 1600s. Mary Baker Eddy was born in 1821, 200 years later. She's not, she was not one of them, but she's a descendant of those groups, and it's not a mere coincidence. She is a direct descendant of those people who came to establish a nation on the basis of religious freedom, freedom of speech, and freedom of press. Having been born in 1821, when she was young or a child, naturally she heard a lot of conversations around her and the family about the independence period in the United States. It's natural. Independence had happened only 45 years before she was born. So she breathed the history of the United States when she was little. She was made up with those ideas. She was made up with beautiful um, ideas of freedom and of worshiping. She was, as I said before, a very devoted student of the Bible. The Bible was her anchor. The Bible was her teacher. It was the only authority. Her and all those pilgrims and her family they were totally Bible-oriented. But she was taught, as was prevalent at the time in the United States and in many other countries, a very austere, very severe form of Christianity in which God punishes and God demands obedience and demands a certain behavior. For her, when she read the Bible, she found God's love. She didn't found, find God's austerity. She didn't find God's anger. She found God's love. She found healing when she read the Bible. There are so many cases of healing in the Bible, and she kept reading them, and the more she read, the more she realized that God is love. It, what was being taught to her, that austerity of punishment, she couldn't agree with. And she was so excited against those teachings as a teenager 
that one day when she heard her parents talking about, her father talking about that with a relative, about the theory of predestination and the condemnation that God dispensed on certain people arbitrarily, she was so in disagreement with that that she became sick and she had a fever. Her mother, who was not totally in agreement with that, asked her to think of God's love that she knew she had found it in the Bible. Her mother asked her to pray to God as love instead of being in rebellion against this theory or afraid of it. She did. She was 12 years old. She prayed to God and found God's love. As she found God's love, God's love found her, and the fever disappeared. Now, this is not merely, although it is an extraordinary case of instant physical healing through prayer, but it's more than that. It put her on a path of conviction that God is love, and she was going to find more of that in the Bible. As I say, she was Bible-anchored, Bible-oriented. To me, the Bible is a dynamic history, a dynamic record of how God reveals himself. The Bible is full of episodes in which people who were trying to understand God defended the idea of God, defended the spiritual idea. The Bible is a dynamic record of how God reveals himself. That's what Mary Baker Eddy finds, and she tells us how to find it, and we can find that dynamic record. It's not a, a book of tradition or doctrine. It tells how God's love is available to mankind at any time, including today. Mary Baker Eddy got married very young. She married a southerner in the 1840, 1840s. If you know the history of the United States, she was from New England, which was the birth of independence and of equality. And she went to live in the South with her husband. She was a stranger in a culture that was completely hostile to what she thought. She found slavery. She didn't agree with it, and she, she didn't approve of it. She had to deal with it. She was happily married, but culturally and ideologically, she couldn't accept what she was seeing. So she too had her experience of being in a strange, hostile mental atmosphere. Her husband passed on very quickly after they were married. She was very young, she was pregnant, and she had to go back home. So she took the journey back to her father's home, and that was another pilgrimage for a home, having to go back alone without money, without health, and pregnant. Things didn't get easier. She went back to her father's house. Her mother died. He remarried. She had a child. And she and her child were not welcome in the stepmother's home. So her pilgrimage towards a home was very rough at that point. She didn't have her own financial means to support herself and her child. She kept finding that the Bible was her only guide, her only friend, and that's where she found inspiration. That's through the teachings of the Bible. She was on her journey looking for a better way of living. She had to leave her parents' house 
the child was sent away to be raised by another family, so she was alone, destitute, and very often she found herself in a very modest rented room with very few means, living out of the ideas that she imparted, which healed people. And often she was very welcome because people were healed with her ideas and, and often she was kicked out because the ideas were drastic. So she had a long journey home, a pilgrimage. She was looking for her place in God and she knew it was there. Her ideas were very, very vivid, that God is love and that God provides for everybody, that there's no inequality, that God heals, that love heals. At one point, she had suffered an accident, had spinal injuries that were supposed to leave her crippled. She felt she was dying and during a period of great agony, she read the Bible, read an episode in which Jesus heals, Jesus heals a crippled man. And at that moment, she saw the reality of God's presence, the spiritual reality of God's presence that pierced through the appearance of life in matter. As she saw that spiritual reality right where she was, the pain disappeared and she got up and she was healed of her injuries. That was the moment when she discovered the science of Christianity. She was then convinced that there is a law that Jesus knew, there's a science that Jesus knew, which healed. And she needed to know more about it in order to give it to mankind. She spent more years after that looking for more Bible understanding, more understanding of Jesus' teachings, and the more she studied, the more people were healed with her ideas. She was still living for many years in rented rooms. At one point, when her situation, living quarters were so precarious and difficult, one of her sisters, who was married, very well established, had a beautiful home, very generously approached her and asked her, why don't you come live with us? We have a beautiful home. You can have perfect accommodations and live with the dignity that you deserve if you want to come live with us. With one condition, that you give up all those ideas that you are learning about spiritual healing and understanding. She couldn't give that up. The price was more than what she could afford to pay. So she declined and went on healing people and studying more and more of the Bible so that she could arrive at the possibility of articulating what she had discovered in order to give it to mankind. At that point, she knew it was her mission to give it to mankind. She couldn't keep it to herself. She was healed. Her situation was better. And gradually, she began to be economically better too because people were healed and paid her. So her financial predicament also began to subside. She moved from mere faith in God to reasoning from the standpoint of God's harmonious presence. The world today is tired of being told how to think and what to do. The world of today demands science. And when you read what Mrs. Eddy wrote, you will find in her lines a scientific language that explains how Jesus healed. She wrote, at a theological era, 
She belonged to that era, and she also speaks a theological language. But in her writings, there is scientific explanation of what God is and how that understanding heals. Talking about herself as an author, as I said before, she wrote several books. Talking about herself as author, in another book she wrote, after a lifetime of orthodoxy on the platform of doctrines, rites, and ceremonies, it became a sacred duty for her to impart to others this new old knowledge of God. She had to break away from a platform of doctrines, rites, and ceremonies up to a spiritual understanding of God, a new old knowledge of God because Jesus knew it, and new because she's bringing it to mankind today to an era that demands scientific explanation. And she's giving it. She puts the understanding of God and of what Christ Jesus taught in a language of science, which is the language of the 19th century, moved mankind into scientific knowledge. She put the science of Christianity right there. And it can be demonstrated in the healing and restoration. It was when she had her healing of the accident was in 1866. She spent years after that studying the Bible, healing people, and getting a much better understanding of what had healed her. The inspiration came to her gradually, and she wrote it. She wrote the way the inspiration came. But then, in order to give it to mankind, she had to articulate it better. She had to herself to study what had come to her in order to give it to mankind. As she was doing that, her own condition began to improve. And one day she realized that there was a house for sale in Lynn, which is a little city near Boston, that she was interested in. And she looked at the house. She was able to give a down payment. And she bought the house. This was in 1875, nine years after she was healed. She spent all that time studying and studying and studying. And now she was able to buy a home and she was able to pay it in a very short time. She got a loan and she was able to pay it off. Now you can imagine in 1875, a woman alone was able to buy a house and pay for it. It's not easy today for a woman alone to do that. But she did it through healing because all her means came from helping other people. Years later, she was able to buy other homes and she never again was suffering from lack of a nice home and they became better and better. Even when years later she was able to buy a magnificent house, she kept her own lifestyle very modest. She didn't like to be looked at as an important figure. She didn't like prominence. She didn't like to be visible. And she didn't like luxury for herself. In this house where she lived, the last house where she lived, which is a magnificent home. She had her own quarters remodeled um, in a smaller proportion to fit her aspirations. She had no intention of luxury or grandiosity. She had her home adjusted, her quarters, her apartment, adjusted to a modest proportion, which is the way she wanted to live her life. Years later, she said to one of her students, who then wrote this in one of the biographies he wrote of her, home is not a place, it's a power. 
I think that is so helpful for all of us to know. Home is a power. She also said, we arrive home when we arrive at the full understanding of God. It's so important for us in our daily lives to have a better understanding of God's ever presence. And that takes us to the right home. And it helps the whole of mankind to get out of the predicament of not knowing where to live or where to go. Now, Mary Baker Brady was an American woman. She's made up of the American culture, freedom, thought. Does that make Christian science American? If you think, for instance, of Thomas Edison, he was an American, he was a scientist, and he created, he invented the electric light bulb. Why didn't we have electric light bulbs before him? Out of ignorance. We didn't know how to do it. Everything needed to create a light bulb existed before Edison. But mankind didn't know how to produce it. He discovered it. And it became available for all mankind. It exists all over the world. Nobody's going to say that the, the electric bulb is American. It doesn't belong to any nation or culture. It's available. The science of he, which Jesus practiced, the science of healing, which Jesus practiced, existed through out history after he taught them, and even before there were healings. Divine healing happened. Jesus just made it available. And Mary Baker Eddy brings the explanation about that to mankind at this time, for this era. The ability to understand Jesus' teachings and to heal through prayer not by asking God, but by recognizing God's harmony, has always existed. Mary Baker Eddy brings it to this era. That doesn't make what she teaches American. It's universal. It's available because she discovered it, just as the electric light is available because Thomas Edison discovered how to use it. She discovered how to use it and taught it to mankind, is teaching it to mankind. The traditional theologies of Jesus' time wanted to hamper his steps and silence his voice. But what he taught was irresistible. It, it couldn't be resisted. So it broke all the barriers of times and cultures, and it's available through all mankind, to all mankind. And so the same thing happens to what Mary Baker Eddy brought to mankind. Perhaps some traditions don't agree with it, because it breaks the barriers and the limits in human thinking and takes them directly to God. Mary Baker Eddy teaches us to work from the standpoint of God's presence to find harmony, not from the human limited condition towards some God out there. It's the other way around. She explains the infinitude of God's presence right where we are as a starting point for all prayer and for all the harmony that can be brought to mankind. So Mary Baker already brings Jesus' teachings scientifically to this era. I have a question now. Can anybody be in a place that's so far away, so remote, that you can't find God's presence and God's help? No. And I'll give you an example. 
once I was traveling with my husband through Italy and we spent a whole afternoon visiting the ruins of Pompeii, of the eruption of Vesuvius. We walked the whole day, it was a tough day. We were staying in Naples, south of Italy. At night, my husband began to have a very violent pain in his leg. And he couldn't put his foot on the floor. So we were in a place where there was no other Christian scientist. This was way before we had cell phones and instant communication. A phone call was a phone call, and he wanted to call a Christian science practitioner with somebody who helps people through prayer in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So we did place a call, and he talked with a practitioner from Buenos Aires who agreed to pray and work for him in, to get him out of that predicament. Now, the distance was considerable. Communication was not instant and wasn't easy. There were no Christian science churches and no other Christian scientists in the area. But we were able to get in touch with a practitioner, and she gave him a few ideas. And one of the things she said was, don't accept that you are in a remote, faraway place. There is no such thing for God. You are in God's presence now. And that presence is harmonious. That's home. Your home in God's presence. And that presence is totally harmonious. This restores harmony. We both held on to those ideas through the night. And in the morning, as the day came up, the pain disappeared completely, and he was able to walk. Well, nothing is too far away from God. Nothing is remote for God. So nobody is in a situation where God isn't present. Nobody is out of God's presence. Not everybody is directly involved with the refugee crisis. But everybody has an obligation to pray and to know that God's presence is everywhere. That question that the two young men followed Jesus and asked Jesus, where do you live? That question is still valid. And today, the Christ God's love in action, speaking to human conscience, can answer that question and say, come and see. Nobody is displaced. Nobody is in the wrong place. No idea of God is out of God's presence. Everybody has a place in God's presence. Divine love demands and allows everybody to see and feel his presence. Not to react to the apparent power of discord, but to respond to its presence and power. This love is constantly making us receptive to it. We just need to stay in tune, in sync with God's presence. In Science and Health, there is a chapter entitled Footsteps of Truth. Mary Baker Eddy ends that whole chapter with a quote, with a, a a line that I would like to use to close this lecture. It says, Pilgrim on earth, thy home is heaven. Stranger, thou art the guest of God. Thank you.